that he speak against them. But see, this is this is God. <coughs> Thus far, the Assyrians, as represented by Damascus, the Philistines, as as addressed in Gaza, and not the Phoenicians, as in the message to Tyrus or Tyre. Again, the Lord is establishing that the nations are responsible to him. <laughs> Whatever form of government they have. Now, this is, uh, this is one of the weaknesses of a democratic system. Is there not a sense of accountability to God that's resident in the system itself? I mean, some, some the people that are in it don't necessarily have to subscribe to that, but the system itself yeah. is more uh, self-centered yeah. than God-centered. Yeah. It can be overcome, you understand. Uh -huh. The nations were formed by the sons of Noah, and it's spelled out in Genesis, 10th chapter. So the, the nations, the nations were developed but that word is used, the nations were developed by them, which means the nations commenced with an acute awareness of the responsibility of the world to God. That's yeah. one thing everybody knew yeah. at that at that time. Also, when God began to deal with Israel, we learned that he cast out nations out of the land he gave to Israel because of their iniquity. Their iniquity caused them to cast them out, and it's it's spelled out in Scripture. It said of uh, Israel that they inherited the land of these nations, that he drove out because of their iniquity, and they ate up the nations. That's how it's described in Numbers 24, 8. They ate up the nations because of their iniquity. I'm very cautious about what I'm going to say now, but there's been a lot of talk among uninformed people how wrong it was for the America to start, the United States to start, when the Indians already occupied the territory and, you know, all this sort of thing. But somebody, without being prejudiced, and sort of thing, somebody has to account for the fact that, these, that the Indians worshiped the earth. A false god. That's all I'll say on the subject, but that's got to be thrown into the equation. And God's already commented in Scripture about what he thinks about nations that live in his world and worship another god. He's made this pretty, pretty clear. Scriptures say through the psalmist, Psalm 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Uh, God's not going to retract that. That's, right. That's still in the Bible. Now, there are at least three factors involved in these judgments of casting out nations and judging nations, at least three factors, possibly more. One is they chose false gods. That's, that's one. That's why he judged Egypt. He judged their gods. That's what those plagues were about. They were judging their gods. That's what he said. That's Exodus 12, 12. And second, the practice of iniquity. That's another reason why God judged these nations. That's in Leviticus 18, 14 and Genesis 19. And third, the maltreatment of the people of God. That was... That was another reason. And that's de declared in 1 Kings 14, 16 and Micah 6, 18. Now this is now the third group of people that treated, that ill-treated the people of God. That's the point that's brought up against them. It's possible that the United States could fall in this category. 
I'm suspicious that it, this may very well be the case because there's more and more activity against the people of God for one reason or another. Now this word is particularly relevant in our time. Jesus warned his disciples, for instance, instance, that they would be persecuted. And then the disciples and their doctrine, they taught people they would be persecuted also, that all who live in God, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The malignment of the saints, this will take place. But God also is going to deal with the people who did this. The saints are not to take up arms and handle this themselves. They're not to do it, but God is going to address it. He shows all through history how he did. Even when people were used to punish his people, he punished the people that punished his people under his direction. Why? Because this is a righteous matter with God. When God says a people belongs to him, you had better not touch them. Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Don't you do it. Sometimes people begin to gossip, you know, and they say bad things about the people of God. And they don't take it seriously. They think they have a right to their opinion. (laughs) I'm sorry they don't. We're not going to fuss with them. We're not going to say, don't say that about me. You hurt me by saying that. We're going to just keep our mouth, hand on our mouth and hold our peace. But God's going to address this. Amen. Even if the person repents, God still addresses it. Saul of Tarsus persecuted the church. God sent Ananias to him to tell him, God's going to show you what great things now you must suffer for his name's sake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the way God is. Amen. Just think what he's going to do to people that have abused his son or reject his son, who is the chief person. Text such as the one before us is, uh, is, is establishing this is the way God operates. With specific, specific regard to their enemies, which Paul is addressing in Romans 12, 19. He says, God says, I will repay. Avenge not yourselves. He doesn't say, just forget about it. Just forget about it and go about and love everybody. That's not what he says in that case. I'm sorry. He says, don't avenge yourself. God's already said, I will repay. Repay what? Repay these people for abusing his people. I will repay. <clears throat> so our text is a case in point of this happening. <clears throat> I want to deal a little bit for a while here. We're going to be touching verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and remembered not the brotherly covenant. But I will send a fire on the wall of Tyrus which shall devour the palaces thereof. Now, uh, it's one thing to read these words that Amos had to tell them. (laughs) Amos had to address these to to Tyrus and tell them what God said. Now, I want to, uh, again, touch on this phrase, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Now, there are purported prophets today who stand up in certain congregations, and they say, thus saith the Lord. Now, I'm not prepared to say that God never said that, but I am prepared to judge what they say. See whether God really said that or not. Listen, a lot of things are attributed to God that He didn't say. Uh-huh. Yeah. You don't know it until you test the spirits, uh-huh. see whether they're of God. Thus saith the Lord. That first postulate is that 
God has something to say. Unlike other gods, God has something to say. This presumes a purpose, see, an objective, and a divine will, among other things. Those are just three. He has something to say. The true God is a speaking God. Now, you'd never know this by the conduct of a lot of professed Christians, but he's a speaking God. He assesses. He judges to his word. He commands, he admonishes, he forbids. I, I get the distinct impression that a lot of Christians don't know this. Not cognitively. They don't have discernment here. That God commands, and when he does, you better do it. And he... Uh, he rebukes, he admonishes, he promises, he has something to say. He never, his words are never suggestions yeah. or admonitions. I'll try, try this. Men say this, you know, try harder, try again. God says, do it. Yeah. Amen. Now, this is, the, we're talking about God here now. He doesn't say that you probably won't be able to do it the first time, but try and stand up and walk. And he is, try, try and stand up and walk. Do the best you can. And if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. See? But God doesn't speak like this. That's right. Judah? As soon as, a, <clears throat> as soon as a command is given from the Lord and you compel yourself to do it, that's when the power comes. Yes. And when we compel ourselves to do what the Lord has commanded, we won't need a second chance because that's when the power is given. That's right. So we can do it. Mm -hmm. That's the great kingdom secret that a lot of people don't know. Yeah. That when you extend yourself to obey the Lord, then's when you get the ability to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whether it's stand up and walk or come out of the tomb, Lazarus, or stretch out your hand, whatever. As soon as extend yourself, which faith moves you to do this, see? Amen. Faith believes God and moves it to, if he says, now, sin not. Well, of course, he says that three times in the Bible. <laughs> sin not. So, well, I can't help it. So I thought, what, that's not the right response. Amen. We all fail. Well, that's, that's not, not like exactly a revelation there. But you take it seriously, and when you do, God gets serious about Amen. helping you to abstain from Amen. Even the appearance of evil. Yeah. Abstain from the appearance. Just abstain from the up. If it looks bad, don't do it. Yeah. Well, that's a fresh word, isn't it? Yeah. Now, in, when, when the Lord speaks of speaking God, he does not speak in vague generalities. Mm -hmm. You'd think he did, the way they're all, all the different versions have been created. Yeah. Why do we have all these versions? Somebody thinks it's not clear. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know what, what other reason can possibly be cited mm -hmm. unless it's a, translated into, into a, a, a language that yeah. other people, <laughs> no, no, no person should be void of scripture. It should be put in their language. So excluding that, yeah. why else would you up to have to update the version of scripture, unless it was that it wasn't clear. All right, I'm saying God doesn't speak in generalities. And because he does it, he's not going to allow the people whom he charges with writing his word to fill it up with generalities. This should, should be reasoned out, should be seen quite clearly. Yes. For man to put the scripture in a language that doesn't require the Holy Spirit to understand. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Brother Gibbon, I think that men generally feel like they God has left salvation up to them. Mm -hmm. And because of this, they think they have a right to go and just do what they want to. That's right. With the, they really don't think about this being the word of God and That's that right. he is superintending mm -hmm. it. Yes, See this, thus saith the Lord. See, that is archaic language in most people's yes. vocabulary. But it's not. 
archaic language. Even when God gave, see, people think they have to interpret the scripture. Now, I'm going to say here that, no, you do not have to interpret. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The scripture has people interpreting dreams. Mm -hmm. Joseph interpreted dreams. Daniel interpreted dreams. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they interpreted the language, the Egyptian language, you interpret it. But no one is said to interpret Scripture. That's not found in the Scripture. In fact, when he gave the Scripture, <coughs> Peter's very careful about excluding human interpretation from what was said. God revealed it to the prophets. Then Peter said, about, this is from the NIV, just to show you that even they got it right. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Mm -hmm. yeah. God didn't say so, so, thus, and so, and then the prophet said, well, this is what I think he meant. Mm. No, for prophecy had its origin in the, no prophecy had never had its own origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So when God showed them a vision like Revelation, uh, yeah. or a vision like Amos had, mm -hmm. or visions like Isaiah had, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit moved them on how to record that. Amen. It, it wasn't a matter of interpretation, mm -hmm. but for, we've got to see this. It yeah. was not... And if it wasn't when it came, I mean, how could it be now? This is, a, this is not the way it works. In Scripture, dreams were interpreted for those that had no understanding. Tongues or languages was, but a word spoken by God is to be believed. Yes, amen. God interpreted. You don't filter the word of God through the mind of man <coughs> and take the result and call it the word of God. Yeah. <coughs> it's not. Now, uh, if further elaboration is required, then God will give the understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Holy men of God knew that. They say, give me understanding. Mm -hmm. Paul would tell Timothy, that the, I'll write what I write unto you, but the Lord give you understanding yeah, in right. all things. Yeah. So, the, yeah. so if it's not clear, the Lord gives the understanding. Men are obliged to hear and receive what God says. Mm -hmm. Like this is not an option. If God speaks to men, men have got to hear it and digest it and believe it. Amen. His utterances can't be treated with indifference. They can't be. And you think how many of what how much of what God has said is treated with indifference. People don't even know what God said. They don't, there are all kind of professing Christians have very little idea about anything God said. And this is a speaking God we're talking about that has said a lot. And yet they are abysmally ignorant of it. And I'm saying that's inexcusable. Every man lives not by some words of God, Men, men do not live by the gospel of John, like some people think, or the book of Acts, like other people think. They live by every word of God, Luke 4, 4. Man lives by every word of God. That statement can't possibly be more precise. Now, concerning his work among men, God announces what he will do in Scripture. And when he does, it's like a challenge mm -hmm. thrown out to the devil, principalities and powers, in rules of the darkness of the world, spirits of wickedness in high places, saying, stop this if you can. Mm -hmm. He announces it. See, no, no king tells his enemies what he's going to do. Uh -huh. But God, right out of the chute, yep. told yep. Satan, the seed of the woman's going to bruise your head. Right out of the chute, yeah. he told him. That's what God's doing. Amen. He's showing you. He's he puts himself at what for any other personality would be a handicap. Uh -huh. 
to divulge to those who are his enemies what he's going to do, which is what he's doing in Amos here. He's, he's telling the people what he's going to do. So he announces what he's going to do to prove to you that there isn't anyone in heaven or earth or under the earth that can stop him from doing it Amen. or cause him to postpone it or make him modify it. We also should say in this, thus saith the Lord, that what God says on the matter is the final word on that subject. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the, that's the pinnacle of understanding is expressed in whatever God has said on the matter. Now, any subject, no matter what it is, cannot go beyond in discussion or reasoning. It cannot go beyond what God has said on that subject. Yeah. At, now you're into speculation, and speculation is an attribute of Satan who tries to emulate God and tries to be like God. Mm -hmm. So if God hadn't spoken on that subject, just don't mess with it. Just, yeah. Amen. I understand we're not talking about your job and you can think how to do your job better. We're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. I understand. We're talking about what has divided the Christian world. We're talking about that kind of thing. Yeah. Don't take something further than God took it, and don't come short of where God took it. Whatever he said on the subject. Now, the early church, they, they practiced this. They actually did this. The issue of circumcision come up, and it wasn't clear in the minds of the apostles and elders. Mm -hmm. It wasn't clear in their mind how to handle this. So they all came together. They first of all, they had a witness of people that had been preaching to Gentiles. They said, yeah, yeah. just to let that they were accepted, in the, but they weren't circumcised. So we had a testimony about, mm -hmm. and the acceptance of them was confirmed yeah. by the Cornelius' house. They received the Holy Spirit before they were baptized, which yeah. is pretty disconcerting to some people. But that's actually what happened and confirmed that this. God had accepted these Gentiles without circumcision, so they had a report, and they reasoned about this, and pretty soon James, it all filled together, he stood up and said, to this agree the words of the scripture. He talked about raising up the tabernacle of David and the sure mercy, see it all fell together. In other words, what God had said on that subject as soon as James saw it, that ended the discussion. Yeah. We're done discussing now. Uh -huh. We're done discussing now. Yeah. Now we're gonna we're gonna write a letter to the Gentile churches on what not to do. Don't listen to these people that told you to be circumcised. Or that's updated. Don't listen to these people that say you have to be baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Like. Plug your ears. Don't listen to the people talk about being slain in the spirit. Yeah. Uh -huh. Or you have some special miraculous thing that happens to you that confirms you've been called. Mm -hmm. You take what God has said on the subject, and that when you want, once you know it, you gotta know it. Once you know it, that ends yeah. that yeah. ends the discussion. Amen. Once you know it, faith is the evidence. That's right. Faith is the evidence. Yeah. Now <clears throat> One other thing about, thus saith the Lord, God has magnified his name, his word above all his name. Yeah. Now, some of the translations, they can't actually say this. The text, it's on Psalm 138, too. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Now, some versions say that Thou hast magnified thy word and thy name. And it's quite a few of the modern versions, that's the way they read. Not all of them. Some of them, uh, here's, here's uh, some of the other versions. Thou hast made your word greater than your name. That's basic Bible English. Thou hast made your word even greater than the whole of your reputation. That's the Jewish Bible. Your promises surpass even your fame. That's the New Jerusalem Bible. Thou hast made thy saying 
Thou hast made great thy saying above all thy name. That's Young's literal translation. And the Amplified Bible says, And you have magnified your word above all your names. So I, I just read that to show that there's a kind of a departure by some, and it is a departure. They find it hard to actually say what this text says. But some people more scholastically honest have said it just the way it is. He's exalted his word, magnified his word, made his word larger than all the rest of his divine attributes. Which are quite numerous. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Why does he do this? If you can't believe what God says, nothing else about God can be believed. Yeah. Amen. If God can't be trusted, nothing else counts. Yeah. Amen. On the text in Psalms that we just read, the psalmist articulates something that must not be overlooked. Worship and praise, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Amen. Why will you do that, David? Because I just, I got this feeling. I, I, I kind of like feel like I should do this. And he says, for, yes. this is why. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. That's why. So those who have no dominating regard for the word of God, they are pretentious in worship. And they're hypocritical in praise. And it doesn't make any difference who it is. Now this would be very hard for some people to receive. Or you can cut this verse out of your Bible. That's the other alternative. <laughs> Take Jehudai's pen knife and just... But I don't suggest that uh, be done. God cannot tolerate lifeless worship and praise. He's going to address it in this book here. In fact, picture this being said about a modern worship and praise, or praise and worship, excuse me, praise and worship service. God responded, Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. Or stringed instruments. Vials be stringed instruments. Why did he say that? Because their heart wasn't in it. They, are, they were too ignorant of his word. They didn't have a compelling appetite for the word of God. They weren't living by every word of God. They were playing at religion so God says I can't even stand your meetings they're obnoxious to me just take them away don't come in the temple with this kind of stuff that's what he was saying there's been enough of this kind of pollution in our day too much of it I might say the church has been invaded with an army of novices the unlearned and ignorant and they've been charged with leading the church in praise and worship. <laughs> oh, my, what a tragic state of affairs. Amen. Now, as I mentioned, if God cannot be trusted to do what he says or promises, he can't be trusted at all. This is why he's magnified his word above all his name. He's hinged your concept. Your concept of God is hinged, hinges upon what you know he has said. Yes, amen. Amen. If you know very little of what he said, you have very little trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At best, an That's infantile. Right. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the trust isn't valid. It just means you've got to do some, some yeah. growing. Because God says some pretty hard things for the yeah. flesh. Good. Yes. And an economy of faith that accentuates what's just been said. If, you can't, if you're going to live by faith on every word of God, it's got to be right. That's right. That's right. You can't have doubts about it. Yeah. A person or a church or a doctrine that in any way minimizes what God has said has marginalized God yes. Amen. himself. Mm -hmm. Now, they may say they worship God and they love God and so forth and so forth, mm -hmm. but if they minimize his word, 
And there, how do you minimize his word? Not by saying, I don't think every word of God needs to be known. It's, but they live that way. They don't, they don't know every word of God. <laughs> they don't know all the scripture. See, from a child up, Timothy knew the scriptures. A lot of the children growing up today, hey, they don't know the scriptures, and that puts them at a decided disadvantage. The words, thus saith the Lord, call our attention. What God's going to say, well, it's important, to say the least. Yes. Sometimes I've heard, I've actually heard people say that they shy away from reading certain passages and books of the Bible because they're hard to understand. Oh, yes. <laughs> but the... The truth is, is that we have to expose ourselves and be faithful to what is given in the written word mm -hmm. if we want to have the insight given for what that word was written. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. Now, any word of God that's not understood because the things that I reveal belong unto us. Mm -hmm. yes. See, whatever God has said mm -hmm. is intended to be understood. Yes. Brother Jeremy. Okay, about... Uh, if you don't give yourself to something, then the Lord won't undergird that. But if you do give yourself to something, the Lord will. And I, I can um, testify to this. I know I've read scriptures before, and I didn't know what, what they're talking about. But then you or some other brethren had connected the yeah. things. But if I had never read it, mm -hmm. I never tried to understand it, mm -hmm. when you connected it, I wouldn't know what you're talking about. Yes, but sir. because I did expose myself... When I, I was around brethren who were connecting scriptures, I was like, oh, now I see it. Yeah. But it, it doesn't make any sense to, to not um, expose yourself because you think that it's too hard to understand. Well, God, he, you got to give him something to work with. Yeah, now, we're quick to say that you'll not understand all scripture. Yeah. Uh -huh. But you're called upon to believe it. Belief is the key to understanding so you're, the purpose is to believe it. If it goes over your head, like believe it anyway. Yes, that's right. Children do this. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to add or subtract. They don't know the denominations of money. Mm -hmm. What if their mom and dad says, this is five cents or this is 25 cents? Mm -hmm. they, they, they can't figure that out. They don't have what they believe it is. And yeah. so when they see something cost 25 cents, they say, you got to believe Scripture. That's the first thing. Believe the Scripture. Yes. Amen. Sometimes you get understanding pretty quick. <clears throat> For three transgressions of Tyrus. Tyrus. That's a city of Tyre. The most noted city of the Phoenicians. The people there were also particularly identified with the Philistines in the past. They were referred to in the judgment of Gaza. The, this phrase is found, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. So they kind of hobnobbed with the Philistines. These were all, the Philistines, Tyre, and some other countries were all conspired in a confederacy against Israel. It's mentioned in Psalm 83, 4 through 7. Isaiah prophesied against Tyre in the entire 23rd chapter of his book. Ezekiel chapters 26, 27, and 28 were against Tyre. Now this is a third body of people <clears throat> that have been addressed in the same manner. The iniquity extended beyond divine limitations. Three, yet four. That means it went should have been three, but you took it to four. Mm -hmm. Extended beyond divine limitations for three, three transgressions and for four. And they were judged for it, even though they were heathen. Now, they were heathen. They didn't have a law of God, didn't have a covenant with God, didn't have a promise from God. But they went too far. Mm -hmm. So God judged them. And he said, uh, I, I'm not going to turn away now. I'm not going to turn away from this. You should have quit at three, but you went to four. You suppose suppose that's happened maybe in our country? Was enough that you did this or did that, that <coughs> you went further. Yeah. <coughs> you got to traffic in narcotics and you made harlotry 
standard and your divorce raised out of control and you went sanctioned what you call same-sex marriages and that's the yet four. Yeah, uh -huh. That's in the yet four. Category. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is the reason specified for the judgment. You're going to tell them why. Yeah. Because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom. I speak of the captivity of Israel. So there's another nation. I judge because of their treatment mm -hmm. of Israel. Yeah. This people spoke against Jerusalem people of Tyre. And it's mentioned in Scripture, when Jerusalem was at its weakest point, mm -hmm. they took advantage of it. Yeah. Here's Ezekiel's word on it in Ezekiel 26, 3. Son of man, because that Tyrus has said against Jerusalem, aha, she's broken. That was the gates for the people. She is turned unto me. I shall be replenished, and she is laid waste. I'm going to take advantage. I'm yeah. going to take her now. Mm -hmm. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee as the sea causeth his waves to come up. Yeah, you... <laughs> you saw the church, you charlatans. You saw the church was weak. So you come up with the gospel they like to hear, and you fattened your coffers when my people were ignorant. Oh, see, this has all been noted by God. Amen. You mega church pastors, you saw the people couldn't stand a lot of exposure. So you you started this stinking mega church, and you said, you don't have to have a lot. We'll just have a couple hours a week. And that, mm -hmm. what, what what is all of that? That's exploiting. The people, uh -huh. and the men who do it are pretty uh, well off financially. God has noticed it. Amos declares they had also delivered up captured Jewish people to Edom. That's the same sort of language that was spoken against Gaza. However, a little bit different. In Gaza, it said they carried away the captive, mm -hmm. then delivered them to Edom. Mm -hmm. But the Tyrus, they didn't carry away the people. They delivered them after they'd been carried away. It appears as though they, Gaza, the, the, the Damascus did not personally deliver them all to Edom, but sold them, mm -hmm. apparently, some of them purchased by Tyrus, and then Tyrus sold them to the Edomites. Now, this was a practice. Tyrus was in the practice of selling mm -hmm. captives. It's mentioned in Joel 3, 6. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold, he's talking to Tyrus, have ye sold to the Grecians. See, so they took the captives, yeah. they made money off them, mm -hmm. sold them to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it appears that those in Tyrus received and purchased some of the captives of Israel and then sold them to the Edomites. Now the practice of selling slaves is mentioned in Scripture. The people did this. So here, here's the uh, people came, came, the people came in from Gaza, mm -hmm. sacked Jerusalem, carried away the captive of the people, and then instead of herding them all up into Edom, they sold them at some of these seaports. Tyrus was a seaport. Mm -hmm. So they sold. There were people that dealt with selling slaves. That's, yeah. that's what they did. That was their business. It's mentioned in Ezekiel 27, 13. Javan, Tubal, and Meshach, they were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men. <laughs> That's how they made money, sold. So some of these men were the children of Israel, yeah. children of God. So they participated, Tyrus participated in the sins of other people. Yeah. Damascus came in and took the people captive. Mm -hmm. But then 
tyrants, they joined in by purchasing some of the captives and making some money off of them themselves. Now this gives some meaning to this word that Paul said to Timothy. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Oh. Yeah. How can you partake of other men's sins? Maybe by doing the same thing? By capitalizing on what they did. By making a profit out of what they did. Yeah, right. See? Don't participate in other men's sins. Then he says that to them. So that's that's reason number one. You do you you profited by delivering my people to Edom, which were the progeny of that profane fornicator Esau. Yeah, uh -huh. Of all the people you sold them to. You did to Edom. But you remember not the brotherly covenant. All right, now God's talking about something that actually happened uh, over a hundred years prior. The brotherly covenant. It was an unwritten covenant between Hiram, king of Tyre, and David. When the Lord established David as king over Israel, Hiram king of Tyre made a covenant with David. And when the Lord had established David as king over Israel, Hyman, king of Tyre, apparently recognized this and sent some messengers and some craftsmen, and they built David a house. This agreement between Hiram and David continued on through Solomon. And I want to read to you what Hiram told Solomon. This is the covenant. I said you the brotherly covenant. You, you forgot the brotherly covenant. This is in, found in 1 Kings 5. I'm going to read verses 7 through 11. It came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon yeah, well, what it was that Solomon told Hiram, he said, you've heard that my father David wasn't able to build a house to the Lord. I'm going to build it, and I'm asking you for some lumber to help build it. It came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, which hath given to David a wise son over this great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which thou sentest to me for, and I will do all I desire concerning timber of cedar and concerning timber of fir. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon under the sea, and I will convey them by sea in floats under the place that thou shalt appoint me, and will cause them to be discharged or unloaded there, and thou shalt receive them, and thou shalt accomplish thy desire in giving food for my household." He agreed, I'll do this for you, you do this for me, because we're a little short on wheat over here. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees, according to all his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household, and 20 measures of pure oil. Thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year. So this is a covenant, see? It's an unwritten covenant. And, and Hiram was the king of Tyre. That's, that's the point. Hiram was the king of Tyre, yeah. and he made this agreement. Uh -huh. We'll supply materials. You supply food. Mm -hmm. And Amos is told by God, you tell the people. They didn't remember this brotherly covenant. So instead of coming to the aid of Israel, like Hiram did, you exploited Israel and gave them over to the Edomites. Now that happened approximately 118 years before. Men probably forgot. That, that's a lifetime for most people. For most people at that time, that was a lifetime. So they probably forgot all about that covenant. But uh, God didn't forget about it. You might say that a group of people form a country and they pledge themselves to worship God. 
and they build this kind of God relationship into their, uh-huh. into their documents of the country. Mm-hmm. Then some years pass, and then people forget that. Yeah. But God didn't forget it. That's right. Amen. God doesn't forget it. Uh-huh. Well, that was a brotherly covenant indeed, wasn't yes. it? I'll give you all your need, just as much as you need, lumber and cedar, not not uh, cheap trees, cedar and fir, and you send me some wheat and some oil. Brotherly covenant. Now, here's an example of a promise God made to Abraham. He said, I will curse them that curse thee. That's Genesis 12, 3 is restated in Numbers 24, 9. I will curse them that curse thee. Mm-hmm. Hiram blessed them, mm-hmm. so he blessed Hiram. That's right. Then as time passed, the people from Tyre cursed Israel, so God cursed them. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Now, you can build your life on something like that, see? Mm-hmm. So he says, I will send a, div- a fire on the wall of Tyrus, which shall devour the palaces thereof. A fire on the wall. It's the same language used in the judgment of Gaza. I'll send a fire on the wall of Hazel, who was the king. Now, it's not mentioned a fire on the wall in in that prophecy. It's not mentioned of Damascus. It's not mentioned a fire on the wall of Damascus. But Jeremiah, he did mention that. He said, I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus. So the the walls around a city were a means of protection. Uh They provided safety for the people. They were a defensive barrier. When Israel was en route to Canaan, they overthrew walled cities. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The cities over which Og, king of Bashan, ruled. Of that overthrow, Moses said, now listen to this. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him until none was left to him remaining. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities. That's 60. If I were to tell you, name 60 cities, you'd have to, we'd have to really work at it. 60 mm-hmm. walled yeah. cities. 60 cities. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars. I am beside them unwalled towns a great many. So it is quite a exploit, wasn't it? Yeah. There, in the words of Scripture, as stated in Numbers 14.9, their defense departed from them. Yep. God sent a fire in their walls. There's nothing, nothing to stop the enemy from coming in. Yeah. Amen. Now, I'm going to suggest to you this has happened mm-hmm. yeah. to the professed church. Yes. Uh-huh. All kind of enemies have got in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did they get in? The wall was burned with fire. God has judged the modern church by burning up its protective wall. And now all kind of enemies can come in and traffic. Protection is gone. Now as we consider spiritual warfare, wrestling against principalities and powers and so forth, casting down imaginations, Here are two circumstances we can experience. The enemy being unable to defend himself and the Lord being with us. That's what the text says. The defense has departed from them. This is Numbers 14, 9. The defense, their defense has departed from them and the Lord is with us. So those are two factors. <laughs> Ooh, I love to hear about it. Their defenses are departed, and the Lord's with us. 
Many, if not all, spiritual battles are lost because a proper relationship to God has not been cultured. So the enemies have walls, and the Lord's not for the, for the professed people. Now, maybe you can think of some challenging situation right now that requires divine power. You ponder, and there's something you're experiencing, and you have this case. Enemies. And you wonder, what kind of advantage can I have in this case? All right, you can ask for their defenses to depart for the Lord to be with you. Those, are th those two things. Now, David prayed like this concerning his enemies. Now, these are texts, the imprecatory psalms. These are very, very difficult for some people. But if you understand them right, they're very good. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions. That's Psalm 58, 6. Was that an improper prayer? Well, David wasn't rebuked. He wrote of the, of the Lord smiting the enemies on the cheekbone. Smite them on the cheekbone and break their teeth. <laughs> He's taking away their defenses, see? Nehemiah prayed, or Moses prayed, concerning some of the Israelites. He said, Respect not thou their offering. Yes, right. How, would you, mm -hmm. how would you like to have that? How would you like to have a man of God pray that against you? Don't respect, don't pay any attention to their offerings. Mm -hmm. Can I pray that? If you have some understanding, yes, you can yeah. you can pray that. Don't accept what they're offering. Yeah. God did hear that prayer. Oh yes, he did. Yeah. Amen. 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 <laughs> Nehemiah prayed concerning his enemies. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. See, is it right to pray something like that? Well, was Nehemiah rebuked or has God changed? Yes, it was right. If you see it right, Paul, well, Paul prayed like this. Paul prayed, 2 Timothy 4, 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Amen. So is it right to pray that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's right to pray that. If you're praying like out of a spirit of vindictiveness, that's not right. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. If you are trying to avenge yourself, that's not right. That's right. But it certainly is right to call God's attention to your enemies. Yeah. Uh -huh. yep. He laid a snare for me, Lord. Mm -hmm. Make them fall in their snare. Yeah. Well, that's several times in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. It's not that the people of God seek to hurt and harm their enemies. Mm -hmm. They still heed the word of their king. I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despite they'll use you and persecute you. We still heed that word. Uh -huh. But we also learn that this doesn't most of the time change the people at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it does take away the retaliatory spirit yes. Amen. from God's people. Uh -huh. Imagine the spiritual warfare. We are not to ask the Lord to help our enemies or bless our enemies in that matter of warfare. Mm -hmm. Not there. Mm -hmm. We do seek for their defenses to depart from them. And it, this is a lot, a lot of places in the book of Psalms, this is there. Mm -hmm. that their defenses, that the thing that makes them strong will become their weak point. Mm -hmm. Now, only God can do this. You can, none of us can do this. But I'm, I'm just saying that this, God has revealed he does things like this. Yes. And we can trust him to do it. <coughs> we are, so to speak, asking God to send a fire on their wall. And I, I say that knowing that it's, this is hard for some people to, to digest, so we'll not press the matter yeah. because we, we want people to think about this, not yeah. just to uh -huh. turn it down, so to speak. Yeah. And I'll destroy their palaces. That speaks of the seat of their power. Mm -hmm. In other words, there won't be anybody to lead them mm -hmm. 
in their activity against God's people. He'll take their leaders away. So they get, see, they'll be helter-skelter. Mm -hmm. Won't be able to carry out their will. That same judgment was pronounced against Damascus and Gaza. That the leaders, those that held a scepter, they'd have no one to lead them in either an offensive or a defensive posture. Now this judgment was actually fulfilled in Nebuchadnezzar. It did come to pass. Ezekiel also prophesied of the instrumentality of Nebuchadnezzar in the destruction of Tyre. Here are his words. <clears throat> Ezekiel 26, 4 and 7 through 9. They shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like a top of a rock. It means I'll remove all the structures and everything. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the king of kings from the north, with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. He shall slay with the sword thy daughters in the field. He shall make a fort against thee and cast a mount against thee and lift up the buckler against thee. He shall set engines of war against thy walls and with his axes shall he break down thy towers." Strong, strong language. This is thought to have taken place about 598 B.C., which is 160 years after this prophecy. So once again, we see the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. That's Psalm 19.9. God did this. Men didn't, men, he used men, but he didn't, he didn't use Israel. In this case, he brought Nebuchadnezzar in to pay back Tyrus for what they did to his people. Yeah. See, when the Lord said to Israel, you're the apple of my eye, that was the truth. It wasn't because they were so good, mm -hmm. because he chose them, That's right. set his heart upon them. If he's going to chase them, he's, he's the one who did it. Mm -hmm. And if he used somebody else and they went too far, he wasn't trying to destroy Israel. Mm -hmm. He's going to leave a remnant. See, and they were they were shooting for getting rid of everybody. Yeah. But he he determined to leave a remnant. Yeah. He's, same in the church, the same as the church. Nobody can really destroy the church. Yeah, right. There'll be a remnant that will survive. Yeah. There'll be an obedidim that'll hide them. Mm -hmm. There'll be some some way that they'll not be able to get to them. I trust that you can. Uh, you can make sense out of, out of all this. The scriptures tell us that there are some books in heaven yeah. and that the things men do are recorded yes. in the books. And that on the day of judgment, these things are going to be brought up. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a preliminary judgment that lived out in miniature scale what's going to happen on a global scale see these records when it says they're written books it doesn't mean there's a library in heaven mm -hmm. oh if there is I'll have no objection <laughs> but it, what it means is God doesn't forget yes, that's right. see time erodes memory for men but it doesn't with God it doesn't mm -hmm. so here's people over a century after they committed the sin went too far over a century later when they themselves had probably forgot about it we're making any association with, whoop, God dredges this up. Mm -hmm. Sends his prophet to say, just so you'll know who God is and that you infringed mm -hmm. on his dominion and you persecuted his people mm -hmm. and treated them wrongly, I'm going to visit you now. Yeah. Now this is all a prelude to what he's going to say to Judah and Israel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see, he sensitized them. See, it's like when God wanted to convict David of his sin with Uriah the Hittite. It's called the sin of Uriah the Hittite mm -hmm. yeah. when he took Bathsheba. He sends Nathan, remember? He yeah. said, you know, there was a man in the kingdom here, very poor. He only had one little ewe lamb. That's all he had. His neighbor, he, 
he had all kind of sheep and lambs. And what he did, he and his neighbor invited someone over and went and took this man's one little ewe lamb. And that was the dinner for the, for the guest. Yeah. David said, show me the man. Mm. Who is it? He says, you're the man. Yeah. See? He, Israel's going to do the same, and they're going to say, yeah, let's give it to him, Lord, that Damascus had it coming. Amen. Mm. Huh? Gaze, like, let him have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tyrus, let him have it, Lord. Mm -hmm. Then when they get good and incense, he's going to show them, you yeah. did the same thing. That's God's manner. Yes. Maybe I've had some experiences I won't go into, but I've had some experiences where that yeah. that's happened to me. Amen. That I notice in somebody else something I need to pay attention to myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to close there, but it's a uh, it's a remarkable text. I'm getting a lot out of this Amos, this index to God, how he particularly how he deals with humanity, which itself is a phenomenal area of consideration, how the creator deals with the created. He doesn't just like roll roughshod or yeah. uh -huh. crush him. He, he doesn't do that, see? He could, yeah. I guess. Maybe his nature won't let him do it. But it shows you how he deals with humanity. Mm -hmm. Actually, he's very gentle. Amen. Very gentle sometimes allows a century to pass before he really... Maybe someone during that century kind of wake up. Yeah. Maybe they'll, they're during that time, maybe they'll discover the book of God in the house of God mm -hmm. <laughs> and change their course, see? Nineveh repented at one and point. Then, amen. So he did destroy them eventually, but at one point, that generation repented. That generation repented, amen. They, and they were a witness mm -hmm. to a future generation. That's right. That if you can, if you can, if you will respond to what God said, you'll enter into His favor. Yeah. It takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's right. Amen. Others have anything to say? Yes, Brother Brett. This instruction to neither be partaker of other men's sins. Um, this is something I hadn't given a whole lot of thought to, but your statement here that we can do this by gaining profit from others' iniquities. Yeah. It's occurred to me that there are many ways in which you know, we could ostensibly profit from these things. It's not just financial. It's ease. It's reputation. It's yes. association with people. It's not ruffling, you know, in our vernacular today, ruffling people's feathers or making mm. waves or that type of thing. But sometimes when you identify that what a group of people is doing is contrary to what is pleasing to God, then to remain in that is partaking in their iniquity. That's very good. Yes. Very yeah. good observation. And yeah. this whole lesson is a wonderful word to cause us to uh, seek to identify what categories, mm. you know, whether we're in a category that God is going mm. to bless us or whether God is going to judge us. Oh, and if amen. we're in the category where judgment is going to fall, get out of it. Amen. Mm. Mm. Amen. Brother Jonathan. You mentioned this bringing your enemies to the Lord's attention. It was a really interesting thought for me. I thought about the Egyptians pursuing Israel into the Red Sea, the Lord knocked the wheels off their chariots and then he consumed them. That kind of gave me a picture of the effect these prayers can have. The Lord can frustrate your enemy's efforts mm -hmm. to harm you. Mm -hmm. And when you're reading prayers like that, I mean, the fact that you're going to the Lord and praying for that to me is like an acknowledgement that it's his position to deal with them and not yours. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Paul said about Alexander the coppersmith, God is going to do that. Oh, he? yes. Amen. He is going to judge men according to their deeds. So yes. Paul wasn't out of line in saying that. Right. As far as God's will. Yeah, going back to the earlier the discussion on the on interpreting Scripture, um, it's, it's my observation that most of the time when people have trouble with the Word of God, they say, I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. What, actually, actually, what they should say is, I don't understand it. They shouldn't say, it isn't clear. Mm -hmm. Very good, very so I'm, good. I'm wrestling with how to say this, because I don't want to... No, I see what you're... I, I know the point you're trying to make. Um, 
But normally the, the, the problem's not in the word. It's not what see what men modern man tends to do this. Modern man, when man has a problem with the Bible, modern man assumes the problems with the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is an underlying assumption. Yes, here. amen. And it's it's born out of humanistic scholarship that teaches mm -hmm. people to be suspicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it teaches you to be suspicious. Rather than like you, you, like you correctly stated, the word of God is to be believed. You start there. Yeah, right. And Augustine said, through faith comes knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. By faith we understand. That's right. Yeah. But, so, mm -hmm. so what happens is people, see, people bring baggage to the text yeah. of mm -hmm. Scripture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think all, all of us... You know, we need to we need to be maybe a little more merciful sometimes because we all had baggage too. You, yeah. you come out of a church situation where you were taught bad doctrine. Mm -hmm. You had to unlearn that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so all of you have experienced there were texts of the Bible you thought were hard to understand. It wasn't the text, it was you. That's right. Mm -hmm. It was you. Yep. That's right. There was you had some block in your mind. There, there are some people that will not read certain parts of the Bible because that certain parts of the Bible are condemning what they're doing. Yeah. And so they say, oh, well, this is a hard text. It's yeah. hard saying who can receive it. What they yeah. mean is, I want to do this, and the Bible's saying not to. That's what they actually mean. Yeah. But see, people aren't, people aren't honest uh -huh. in what they say, That's yeah. right. particularly when it comes to the Bible. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. That's uh, so... I'm not saying this is precise. I've been I've been sitting here thinking about how to say this. It's not coming out very well. But whenever I guess to, to, to make the the point I wanted to make is, you always adjust to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you always assume that if there's a problem, it's in you. Yeah. yeah. This this is this is humility mm -hmm. before right. the Word of God. That's right. You always assume the Bible's clear. It's, if it's not clear to me, it's me. It's me. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's not the Word of God. Right. God's, God's not trying to hide things from us unless unless He has intentionally kept it secret because we don't need to know it. The secret things belong to the yeah. Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, I think you see this lived out in Apollos. He knew only. The baptism of John. So what happened? Aquila and Priscilla, they heard him in the synagogue. He was in the synagogue. They said, hey, that's not right. They took him home. Because they, de they detected this was a fundamentally honest man that just didn't have understanding. They explained to him the way of God more perfectly, and he, he bought right into it. Now, there's... There is a sort of responsibility for us, if the person is that way, for us to recognize, That's right. be able to discern yeah. that. And not just, I think you're saying, we can't lump people yeah. Yeah. Right. in this obstinate category. Right. There are some people that just don't understand. Mm -hmm. The Gentiles that believed right. didn't understand about circumcision. Yeah. It wasn't that they were dishonest. Yeah. They weren't dishonest. They just yeah. didn't understand because they had this baggage that you yeah. thought. So they... Early yeah. church system guided right. them. It didn't take a lengthy process. Yeah. They knew what to say that uh -huh. directed them out of that labyrinth of yeah. ignorance. And now you have the other category. <coughs> uh, Sister Maddie was raised that the scripture was right. There was no argument with the scriptures. She goes to college, and the first thing they want to tell her is that the Bible is riddled with error. <laughs> she calls me. She's all alarmed. What happened? These people are in another category. That's right. That's right. They're in another category. They're, they're, this is this is inexcusable to 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 take the Bible and you are my instructor and you try to persuade me yeah. that it's riddled with errors. We can't understand it, but there's some of it perhaps that might be right. Mm -hmm. This is this is this yeah. is a different category from what we were just talking about. Even Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. When they confronted something they didn't understand, they knew we got to find someone that does. And Pharaoh, we got to find someone that does understand. So that's what that's what an honest person does. See, wants to understand. So they might say, "I'm having a little difficulty understanding this." They don't say, "I don't think this is right," or some people do say, "I don't think this is right," but. 
you can distinguish between the two. You can pick up on on the way people say something. It sometimes will change how you see the situation. You see, well, they're where I once was. They just it's not clear to them. God can work with someone that's not clear to them. Luke recorded that Apollos was mighty in scriptures. Mm -hmm. Mighty in scriptures, right? Yeah. And they recognized that. Yeah. That's Amen. right. That he would have regard for what the scriptures said. Amen. Mm -hmm. They put things together for him, so yeah. to speak. Something else. You talk about burning down their walls. This, um, this, I, I've been praying this for your preaching on the coming of the Lord that would burn down some walls of false doctrine that have, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to not find someone within earshot that that doesn't believe that there's going to be a rapture and he's going to come back and reign in Jerusalem. What is this? Yes. This is it's just it's, it's just false. It's, yeah. And yet everyone just buys into it. And they haven't even checked yeah. it out. So, yeah. but see this this truth going out can do that. It can have the effect right. of rendering this false wall to be ineffective. See, here's how Satan works. <clears throat> First, he builds up a respect uh -huh. for his ministers. Yeah. He has a variety of ways that will wow. create that. But he first builds up a respect mm -hmm. for his ministers, something that make, gives them credentials uh -huh. so far as men are concerned. Then he speaks through those yes. people. And burning down the walls uh -huh. is it displaying the erroneous value of their credentials. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It's what a person knows mm -hmm. and what God has gifted him to do that are his credentials. Yes, amen. Yeah, that's right. That, that's what that qualifies him to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you can see that, can you? Yeah. Satan, Satan wants people to honor the wrong people mm -hmm. yeah. and then sit back and depend on those wrong people who they think are very wise mm -hmm. and learned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Not forgetting. Oh, yeah. uh, two things on that. One thing we so we can we can believe that he doesn't forget, so he won't forget his promises. Mm -hmm. So we That's can depend right. on that. And then also uh, it can help us to reason more on us being forgiven of our sins. He couldn't forget what it took for him to be able to forget our sins. Yeah. Then so uh, this is a powerful thing of him Amen. forgetting our sins, putting them away. Be with God, forgetting it would be unrighteous. Remember, he says, He is not unrighteous That's to forget right. your work of faith and labor of love. So it's it's unrighteous for God to, do, to forget. It's a human frailty for us to forget. Yes, right. But in the back of your mind, you count on this. God does not forget. Yes. He doesn't forget when I believe. He doesn't forget my intention. See, yes. it's a comfort to those that are living by faith. Yes? Yes? So considering in the beginning when you were talking about um, the Lord repaying, um, avenging his people, that's not just for the people of our time who have read that scripture, but that goes for the brethren um, also who are talked about in Fox's book of martyrs that's and right. um, men and women of um, scripture. And it's not it's not just for those who have read that particular scripture in the New Testament today. It's for God's not going to forget all the people from the very first person who was persecuted to the very last. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I've often been blessed by this brother Antipas. Mm -hmm. We know absolutely nothing about Antipas. But God says, Antipas, my faithful martyr. Yeah. That just to let you know that's in the, yeah. I haven't forgotten that. Mm -hmm. I haven't forgot who killed Antipas. Yeah. Yeah. Now some people get Judge right away, like Herod. He beheaded James. And then John, he was the first apostle to die, and John outlived all the rest of his brother. <laughs> Is that something? Yeah. So they were like bookends to the apostolate. <laughs> mm -hmm. But God didn't forget. And Herod, he, yeah. he paid the price right off. Yeah. And you can trust God to do this. And when he does it, it'll be right. Amen. Don't try and figure out how God should do this because it probably be unrighteous the way you figure it out. Mm -hmm. So just let that be careful for nothing. Yeah. Just let your request be made known to God. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm just 
drag this horse into the ground. But uh, one other comment on interpretation. Yeah. It just occurred to me that, and I've, I think I've said this before, and other people have said it before, but some people, when they, when they read the Bible and they interpret it, you'll notice their interpretation says more about them than it does about the text. Mm -hmm. So it occurred to me that what, what really needs to happen, what actually happens when we read Scripture, the Scripture interprets you. That's it judges. It judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's right. Amen. Amen. The, 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 the word of God has the power to do that. Mm -hmm. If you expose yourself to the word of God, it, it will interpret you. Yeah. That's it right. will interpret your thoughts, your intentions, and it'll lay right. open your heart. It'll, mm. it, the, the Bible will tell you more about yourself yeah. than That's any right. psychologist or psychiatrist Amen. could yeah. ever tell you. That's right. good. That's good. So that actually is yes. working. It, actually, what needs to be interpreted mm -hmm. is the heart of man, mm -hmm. which is which is Amen. deceitfully wicked mm -hmm. above all things. Above Remember, it says the heart is yeah. deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord. Yeah, yeah. He says he searches the the right. reins. That uh -huh. gets down into the detail. Heart and reins. Yes. So, so a valid ministry in this field would be someone who had the wisdom enough to bring scripture to bear on your situation. That's right. Well, that, 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 yep. that's you handling the, yeah. Yeah. rightly dividing that's the right. Word of God doesn't Amen. mean having the Old Testament division and the New yeah. Testament division. He's dividing as yes. handing out. He divided the bread yeah. to the multitude. See? Mm -hmm. The right scripture for the right circumstance. Mm -hmm. so that's handling the right. Yes. That's handling the right, the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You know how to take what God has said on this subject. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And yeah. yes. This text is also like a preview of the day of judgment. Amen. The, the flood, the judgment on Egypt, the, the Babylonian captivity. There are even individual examples of, of the Lord judging uh, people. And all of them, see, the, the, it's going to be the same God that judges on the day of judgment that dealt this judgment Amen. Through, through Amos. It's not yeah. gonna, he won't be one bit different. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Mm -hmm. So God has introduced us to the idea of the day of judgment. Yeah. Yes, for Mike. Also, along the same lines, we see in this this text that uh, God is aware of everything that's going on in His creation, and He's yeah. He's ruling over it. There never was a time when He wasn't ruling over it. He knows. He can tell you all these these three sins and four. He's keeping track. Yeah. Mm. And he remembers the brotherly covenant, and even though, like you said, this was many, many years later. He remembers the covenant. Mm -hmm. He's monitoring what, what these nations are doing. He monitors what each person is doing and what uh, groups of men get together and form mm -hmm. conspiracies. He's, God sees all of this, and he reserves the right to judge it now or, mm -hmm. or to wait until the judgment day. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, Many times like this, he'll let some time pass intentionally yeah. to, to make mm -hmm. it look as though he didn't know mm -hmm. or make it look as though he's forgotten just to see what men will do. <clears throat> it reminds me of <clears throat> this, this, yes, these parables of Jesus where uh, when uh, the, the master went away and after he went away, then he tells you, what did the servants do? My Lord delayeth his coming, is what one of them said. And he began to smite his fellow servants and mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So I think the Lord does that to, to as Brother Gene said, sift the hearts of men. He'll, he'll intentionally make it look like he's not watching. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Sifts the heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Brett. This whole discussion has made me think about what great danger there is in taking the name of the Lord in vain. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> if, Amen. If, 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 if God Himself magnifies His Word above His name, then ought not we to do the same? That's right. Amen. Amen. And I think that a lot of the um, brother Jason's comments have made me think even more about this. That what God has allowed in the degradation of the church through hmm. false teachers is perhaps a result of people not esteeming the Word of God yes. as God Himself does. Amen. Amen. I, I believe that, yes. 
Yes, Brother Jonathan. Brother Jason was talking about when he was talking about how men have interpreted the Word of God. That got me thinking about this too because I've noticed just the environment that's produced this kind of thinking because we live in a time where men love to live for themselves. They like the idea of having your own view, your own take on things. Mm -hmm. And that kind of environment's produced this kind of thing with the Word of God where men feel like they can just do what they want with it. They've forgotten like who the Word's from, who it belongs to. They view it as a it's a book that men wrote, and it's open for interpretation. And they, I'll make it say what I want to say. And so when men don't want to change at the hearing of the gospel, they try to change the gospel. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, when you, you can say, I, I happen to know the author's intended meaning. <laughs> You've heard that. What was the author's intended uh, James' in, intended meaning is not the meaning. These were, these were people were God's mouth, the oracle. They were oracles of God. So it wasn't their intended meaning. It was God's intended revelation. <laughs> yes, Brother Paul. Well, what Babylon has done is they've actually touted this part of their uneducated, of the, of the Apostles General, a previous occupation of being fishermen or whatever. Mm -hmm. and it was an uneducated occupation, but they were familiar with the scriptures. You didn't have... Peter on the day of Pentecost saying, I'm an educated fool, and then start preaching from Joel. Yeah. And, and we don't see that type of thing today. We see a lot of uneducated, and that's in the Bible. There's not a correlation between that's right. how, how the believers were and how the believers, believers use the word loosely, yeah. are now. Yeah, they, no Jew was uneducated. My culture considered them educated, but they were perhaps the most disciplined and educated society of all. Yeah, that's right. Their whole religion was based on reading and cognition. Yeah, their right. their yeah. whole life was based on that. The Bible itself is an education. Yes. Yes. Amen. And, and in the past, in our own culture, it was generally accepted that everybody should study the Bible yes. 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 as a basis for everything else. That's that's right. Right. That used to be taken for granted mm -hmm. uh, in our in our own culture mm -hmm. as it was in with the Jews. Mm -hmm. They learned to read so they can read the Bible. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And and that's that's the way it was from the Reformation up until just actually a few hundred years ago. This all changed, see. Yeah. There's actually a point in time when the whole there was a huge intellectual shift mm -hmm. Not only in our culture, but in Western civilization, right. where everything became man-centered, <laughs> mm -hmm. everything else was questioned, the Bible was questioned, God was invited to leave, mm -hmm. yeah. this sort of thing. It's a, it's a huge. It was a huge shift. Yeah. That we're living in the we're living in the aftermath. That's of this. right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, once you see this, yeah. it explains a lot of things. Right. Yeah. Yes, brother Chip. Say this earlier, and then I forgot. What a shame it is that. As an official position, really, our government is holding up the Quran more highly than <laughs> the Bible. Right. Yeah. I know it. And the Islamic people, of course, you know, they seem to have this great respect for the Quran. You know, it's the holy book. And it seems like less and less people are regarding the Word of God as holy. It, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. It's important to remember that scriptures are revelation, not interpretation. Mm hmm. Amen. Yeah. All right, we'll close there. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the way you've revealed yourself to humanity in Scripture, in history, and we might say case studies of your workings with humanity. We see this as your quest to have men understand you and to know you. And so we pray as we devote ourselves to your word and live by every word of God that we would more and more perceive you in it and also allow that light to shine upon us and search our inward parts. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen.